Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you all for um, showing up in the, in the middle of Hexi. Um, it's nice to see this many people here. Of course, the, the weather cooperated today. I'm Jennifer Hurl, and I'm the archivist at the Myersdale Public Library. Our director, Terry Foster, is manning the camera today. We are recording this little program for the library's YouTube channel. Um, and about halfway through, I want to encourage any of you, and you can be thinking about this in the next five or 10 minutes, any of you who have stories relating to Hexi, or in the case of some of you, Prissy Rug, or you, we have some people here who are descendants of Prissy, but if you're comfortable doing so, we'd like you to, um, partway through our program, come up and share your stories because that, in the end, is kind of what makes all of this so interesting, people's own family stories. But um, I want to start by acknowledging a couple of people who, some of them are here and some aren't today. Um, Terry, um, Hackney and Jody Burnsworth are here from Lens Creek Studios in Myersdale. They're the ones who about a month ago um, spent a couple hours out here one day installing the marker for us. So we, we thank them for giving their time to do that. Um, is Lisa Hall here? Okay, hi Lisa. Lisa is the president of the um, Turkey Foot Historical Society and thank you for coming Lisa. Um, is Kaylin Yunkin? Yeah. Kaylin here. Okay, Kaylin Yunkin lives in the vicinity, and she's the person who helped us kind of get the ball rolling on this, or to obtain a spot to put the marker. Um, as you might imagine, you can't just come out and install a marker on just any property. You have to have the permission of the landowner. So Kaylin helped us get permission from the Game Commission. And there are three gentlemen with the Pennsylvania Game Commission um, who, who helped with that. Um, Steven Leindecker, Travis Anderson, and Mike Gardner. They all helped us obtain permission to install the marker here. So we thank them and the Game Commission. Um, this got started um, last October, about a year ago. Terry actually noticed a post from the William G. Pomeroy Foundation um, online, scrolling through Facebook about a Legends and Lore historical marker program that they have. And she sent it off to me and said, you know, this would be a neat thing to do. And I agreed, but then we had to come up with, okay, what story in our local area would make for good legend and lore? Well, that's where Linda Marker, who is a very devoted library volunteer, and any of you who volunteer for anything, thank you. Thank you a thousand times over. Um, without volunteers, the world would be a sad place. Um, but Linda's the one who said, what about Hexi? And, uh, to us, it seemed perfect um, because Hexi, as you all know, and I know a number of you here know better than I do. Um, I grew up in the Myersdale, Berlin area, so I'm only I'm still learning about Hexi. But Hexi is full of legend and lore, and um, I wanted to read just a little note or two from the Rockwood Historical Society, which Linda is a is a member of. Um, she's actually their secretary, right? Um, they put out three books in, in a few decades ago, um, Down the Road of Our Past. They're nice little um, history picture books. And um, those books feature some stories about Hexi. And maybe some of you knew Clyde Miller. Um, he put out, and I was talking with this gentleman earlier, he put out years and years ago, um, four issues, was it, Linda, of the Hexie Gazette, a little newsletter newspaper that he wrote. He lived in Florida at the time, yeah. right? Texas. Oh, Texas. Texas. Clyde was in Texas, yes. Um, his brother, Sam, 
who authored the book, A Place Called Hexie, lived in Florida, but Sam and Clyde grew up here. Um, and Linda does have um, Sam's book here for sale if anyone is interested in purchasing it. But um, in the, one of the Rockwood Historicals books, Down the Road of Our Past, um, Clyde, in one of his issues of um, the Hexie Gazette, wrote this about Hexie. And I, I think it's a nice way to describe the area. He wrote, the area is nestled in the hills and valleys east of Laurel Hill Creek, south of Kingwood, north of Humbert, and west of Pattytown. It is along the banks of Moses, King Run, May Run, Red Run, and Smith Run. It is among hills called the Church Hill, the Ed Krieger Hill, the Barney Krieger Hill, and the Knob. It is amidst places like the Yunkin Place, the Henry Trimpey Place, the Old Dumbald Place, and the May Girls Place. It is in hollows like the Coke Oven Hollow and Chicken Bone Hollow. It had schools like Rhodes and King. It has a church called Old Bethel with a scenic view. But most important of all, it has heritage. So that's a little bit of kind of what we're doing here with um, this marker is um, kind of just share a little piece. I mean, there's a lot of heritage, heritage to a place like Hexie, a lot of family stories, but just share a little piece of it and help this area of Southern Somerset County maybe become a little better known. Um, there are some other good stories here too from the Down the Road of Our Past books, but if you're interested, come see me and I can, you can read this or, or visit me at the Myersdale Library. I work there in the Pennsylvania room. But I, I want some of you hopefully to share your stories. So um, before we get to that, um, I am going to read a letter from the Pomeroy Foundation because they're the ones who basically provided the um, money for this marker. The marker was managed or manufactured by a company, a little, it's a family run company, right, Terry? Yes. In Ohio called Siwa Studios. I, I'm pronouncing that correctly. And, um, they, um, they manufactured the marker, but the Pomeroy Foundation paid for the, it was a cost of $1,500 to have the marker manufactured. So it cost the library nothing. We just had to apply for it and they chose our story as one of, these legends and lore markers can be found um, all over in many different states. If you go to the William G. Pomeroy Foundation's website, you can see the different ones. And they have other marker programs too. But I'm gonna read a short letter from them. And then some of you hopefully maybe could come up and if you're comfortable doing so, just introduce yourself and why you're here and maybe a story you might have about this area. So this is the letter they sent. Congratulations from all of us at the William G. Pomeroy Foundation on the dedication of your legends and lore roadside marker. We send our greetings from Syracuse, New York, as you unveil this marker that tells of the local lore surrounding Hexibarger, also known as Hexie or Witch's Hill. At the Pomeroy Foundation, one of our main initiatives is to help people celebrate their community's history. We do this by offering grants for roadside markers and plaques nationwide, as well as several, of, several other history-related initiatives, such as National Historic Marker Day, hosted annually on the last Friday of April. We feel strongly that markers help educate the public, encourage pride of place, and promote historic and cultural tourism. How did our mission come about? My dad, Bill Pomeroy, who is founder and trustee, has been passionate about history since his childhood. He has fond memories of riding in the car with my grandfather and seeing historical markers they would stop and read together. In 2005, when my dad established the foundation, he made funding historical markers a priority. He learned that New York State had stopped funding markers decades ago and left it to the communities to raise funds on their own. 
This was the impetus for the Foundation's first marker grant program and later became the springboard for several more programs with a variety of themes, including legends and lore. This marker program helps communities promote cultural tourism by highlighting their local folklore and legends. Today, with this legends and lore marker, you recognize the long-standing tales of witchcraft in Turkey Foot Valley. For your collective efforts in obtaining this marker, we send our appreciation to the Myersdale Public Library and Myersdale and Confluence communities. We would also like to thank our state partner, the Pennsylvania Center for Folklore, which helps to vet our legends and lore applications from the Keystone State. From all of our dedicated staff and trustees at the Pomeroy Foundation, congratulations on your legends and lore marker. Warm regards, Darren Pomeroy, trustee, William G. Pomeroy Foundation. And I would encourage any of you, um, you know, if, if you have an idea for one of these markers and maybe you're associated with the local historical society, I mean, you have to have a nonprofit who would apply for you and help you with that. It's actually, a, as far as grant applications go, it's pretty simple, straightforward. Um, it'd be nice to see maybe some more of these pop up around Somerset County, if anyone had any ideas. Um, before I turn it over to Linda for a story or two, she's given me the eye. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge Ron Bruners here. He's with the Rockwood and Somerset Historical Societies, and he's doing a story on Hexi and, and the marker in the next issue of the Laurel Messenger, um, which is Somerset Historical Center's newsletter. So look for that, and if you're not a member, maybe you want to join so you can get one. Um, Linda, would you come up and share why you thought this would be a good marker? <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> How I came to think about Hexie. My mom was a Hexie girl. She lived just about two or three miles that way. And she could not wait to get out of Hexie. <laughs> um, Hexie at that time was a very poor community. Still is, re relatively speaking. Uh, you notice there's a lot of hills, which is not the best far for farming, and, but they were all German farmers mostly um but and, and then my mom was raised during the depression of course and she taught me i still scrape butter papers to save <laughs> uh, anyway we grew up near well the sam miller's family and the trimpy family we didn't live that far apart we all knew each other in fact he um even mentioned my grandfather in the, in the book. He said that Will Trimpey had a um, sawmill that was so bad that not one single board matched another in size or thickness. But he said it didn't matter because his father was such a bad carpenter, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have mattered. So anyway, we grew up knowing Sam, and I think anybody who met Sam fell in love with Sam. Uh, he was quite a character. And uh, I encouraged him to write the book, which he did. And a lot of people say, once they pick the book up, they never put it down until they finished it. Your dad is one of them. <laughs> he didn't read books. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So um, anyway, I would maybe just ask you to think a little bit about Priscilla Rugg. And she was one of two witches in the area. There was another one. In fact, I think the newspaper today got the two witches mixed up a little bit. They attributed something, what was that, a pig or a goose? To, that was Mary Wino, that wasn't Priscilla Rugg. <laughs> but anyway, she did a good story anyway. But um, think about Priscilla, and you can think of Mary too, if you know some of her history, in terms of how it would have been to be different. You know, we hear this is all the buzz now in the news. Everybody is discriminated against. But imagine coming here amongst the 
bumble of, of German immigrants, mm -hmm. all clingy, they all stuck together. Poor Mary Wino, she, she was Catholic, by the way. They wouldn't even bury her up in the cemetery where my mother's buried, because she was Catholic. So they were very uh, discriminatory. So just think how, how it would have been. Maybe, Mary, maybe Priscilla Rugg didn't know the people were talking about her, but I bet she did. And let that be a guiding principle now, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that's all I have. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, who else would like to, would you like to start? Mm -hmm. Okay, come yeah. up and introduce yourself. <laughs> explain your tie to the area and okay. feel free to share. <laughs> Hi, I, my name is Robin Hare and this is my uh, sister, uh, Lana Hall. And uh, we're yep. maiden name is, <laughs> our maiden know. name is Crawford. My uh, grandmother, um, my mind went blank, a Ethel Fairstone is actually a straight lineage from uh, P P P uh, Priscilla, Prissy. I keep wanting to say Prissy Priscilla. Um, I did some, uh, I'm into genealogy heavy with my cousin from DC. So we share things uh, electronically when we find it. And so last night I got an email, a uh, text message from her saying, you got to go to this opening or this uh, dedication for this plot, this landmark for Prissy. And uh, I didn't even know anything about Prissy's background. I had her in my family tree, but I didn't know that much about her. So I started look, reading things last night and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, it's like, how is someone marked as a witch mm -hmm. in a community of people that are like you, like you were saying that they're, they isolate themselves and they come in with dialects from their own country. And so they do sound foreign and there's a lot of German immigrants too. My grandmother's family was basically a lot of them from England, a lot of them from Austria. And even my own husband had a hard time uh, listening to my grandma talk. She, he didn't understand most of what she said and that's only one, two generations away. So Prissy was my fifth great grandmother. So the whole idea of knowing that she's in this area and knowing how my great grandmother was, uh, women of that source basically are canning, housekeeping, taking care of children. They didn't work outside the home, anything like that. I have a feeling from uh, just my understanding of my great grandmother or my grandmother, she was not a basic, um, she was a square peg in a round hole, so to speak. You know, she wasn't the typical housewife. Mm -hmm. She did it all, but she also was a single mother of five children. Her husband and her were divorced. She uh, chopped wood, she plowed fields, she mowed grass, she banked a fireplace, a furnace, you know. She did everything that a lot of men do in their households, and she spoke with a dialect. So knowing that Prissy was supposedly riding around through the, the woods on a white horse, and that was like out of context for a woman of that nature, I just think that she was a woman before, before her time. She was strong-willed and she did things that no other housewife did at that time, so she was looked at as very strange. I think I would have really liked her, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but that's kind of like what I wanted to say here, that uh, like you were saying, that people that are different, we always kind of tend to push them away from us instead of embracing them and learning from their difference and all the the cool things that she probably had to tell them, they probably would have loved her, you know. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Would anyone else like to share anything? <laughs> My name is uh, Jim Bauer, and uh, I love this area. But I have to tell you, I started teaching at Turkeyfoot Valley in the fall of, I guess it was 1964, okay? And we, we were talking about the witches up in New England. Mm -hmm. And I had one or two students said, well, we have witches at Hexibarger. And I kind of laughed and, and I said, oh, tell me more, you know? And they said, well, yeah, they said, you know, the bridge up here, it's uh, haunted, you know, the covered bridge, the old covered bridge. 
And so I said, well, tell me more, you know. And so they kept telling me these stories. And they, their parents or their grandparents, they believed these stories that they were telling. And so I, uh, in one of my classes, I was laughing. I told these kids that, well, tell your parents to tell me more. Anyways, one boy, uh, Kevin Reeves and I, we came up, they said, oh, this bridge is haunted. Okay, that's the bridge that was back here, right? That burnt down. Mm -hmm. Some locals burned it down a number of years ago and I could have cried when they did that after I found out that it was some locals that did it. They've had a bonfire on the bridge. I hope nobody here was at that bonfire. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I had one or two friends that were there. And uh, Pam Hughes, I don't know if some of you remember Pam Hughes. She had an interest in this area. And I'll tell you what, one guy, and she used to always tell him, she resented him until the, well, Pam passed away, but she resented him because he was one of those involved. There were one or two that I guess were uh, started that fire on the bridge. So it, it went down, but it's a shame. But when I started teaching, I started bringing students back here. Matter of fact, I'll, forget, I'll never forget the first one was uh, Kevin Reeves. I, he was my neighbor, and Kevin and I came back to the Haunted Bridge. And the, the story was that there are these kids and their parents told, well, at midnight, there's a, a headless horseman rides across that bridge, okay? And they believed it, that, that it really happened. So Kevin and I, we were half crazy, I guess, and he came back with me and we went to, and it was scary walking back. I'll never forget, well, this is the road, isn't it, that we walked back to the, to the old bridge. Kevin and I walked back, I was half scared just walking back. <laughs> and uh, we sat there and of course midnight came and there was no headless horseman, <laughs> but your imagination gets you the best of you then. And I went back to school and I told him, yes, there is a headless horseman. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, this legend, it kept growing and kept growing. And everybody wanted me to take them back. I don't know if anybody here ever went with me back. Okay. Uh, it kept growing. Everybody wanted to come up to the cover bridge. And uh, I'll never forget, it grew so much. We had a group from Berlin that came down. It was their youth group. And at the time, I was in charge of the youth group at the Lutheran Church in Confluence. So I agreed to take this youth group from Berlin back to the Cover Bridge. And uh, I told them the legend of, that the parents told me about the headless horseman and all that. And we went back. But what I used to do then, my brother Joe, who was, he was, well, he was pretty heavy. And he'd go up in the woods ahead of the group that I would bring, and he would crack rocks together I, you know I said that's the you know the the headless coming down there you know and uh, Joe used to do that for me but I'll never forget he got scared walking back there by himself <laughs> he didn't like to go back by himself he'd go up above the bridge and hide in the woods and then I'd take whatever group I was taking back any of you have relatives that ever went with me back there nobody Okay, well, they used to love that, and we'd go back there, and uh, Joe would crack the rocks after a while. I'd start the legend of the Headless Horseman. And these kids, their parents, many, or their grandparents, they believe this legend of the Headless Horseman. I, I, I don't know. Have you ever heard that in the, the stories about back here? No. Okay. I haven't. Okay, well, locals believe that story. Some of them did. You know, older people. They said, well... There was a headless horseman, and I wanted to see this headless horseman and went back, and Kevin Reeves and I went back, and of course there was no headless horseman, but then I kept bringing, and when I get home, I tell the kids at school, there is a headless horseman, you know. <laughs> and so I had different groups that I brought up here. And one time we had a group from Berlin. They wanted to see this the legend of the headless horseman. And uh, we got back there, and I'll, I'll, I will never forget, we were coming back out from seeing, and my brother Joe, you know, of course, clacked the rocks together and all that. And they weren't, when you took a group, if you took one or two or three people, they'd be frightened. But if you took a group, they were, you know, 
they weren't frightened at all. And these kids from Berlin, they weren't frightened, but as a matter of fact, coming walking back out, one girl started screaming at the top of her voice. <laughs> she was screaming, and they put a light on, and here were, they brought a scout in, from their school, and they laid it down in the woods up here. And they put that light, and I'll tell you what, my heart dropped. <laughs> I'll never forget that. It was a group from Berlin, and uh, so they scared me. And it was, uh, but anyways, we, we kept taking groups out there. You know, and we try to do it just like two, three, or four at a time because if you took a big, big group, you, you know, you get uh, 10 teenage boys, they're not scared like that. But you get three or four like, you know, just by themselves, why it was scary for some of them. Matter of fact, one girl, Mrs. Hickson's daughter, uh, she got, uh, we went up and, and uh, we did that, and she got um, hysterical. She got hysterical, just started crying. I don't know if you ever heard that, Lisa. No, I haven't. Uh, her one daughter, not the oldest, I guess it would have been Nancy. Uh -huh. But she got hysterical back here. But uh, we used to have more fun doing that, but I guess in some cases it got a little, people got scared, you know. You might have scared people a little too much. <laughs> well, <laughs> we did uh, Mrs. Hickson's daughter. Yeah. I kidded her about, I had her in school, and, I kid her about it. I still kid her about it, you know, when I see her. She comes home usually once or every other year or so. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but, uh, we used to have a good time doing that, and it, uh, it kind of backfired on us <laughs> a couple of times. Well, thank you. Thank okay. you, Jim, for sharing. Okay. I, I was disappointed. When they burnt this bridge down. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a shame. It is. That's a shame. And then once a piece of history like that is gone, it's gone. Right. Yeah. So. Well. Lisa, it, you know who did that? No. You uh -huh. don't. I don't. I just remember your stories about it. About the head of okay. Mm -hmm. Lisa, would you like to say anything as? Other than you know, I'm just supporting all of your work. Well, thank you yeah, for coming. I, I'm still learning about this area, too, from uh, older members of the community. Yeah. You know, the lady that I learned a lot of these things from, they had an article in the uh, Somerset paper. It would have been a, in the 1960s, and Nell Brock was the local writer. Some of you remember Nell Brock, and she was quite a local historian. And so Nell wrote... Uh, Henry Baker Raleigh came down with Nell, and he, she took Henry Baker Raleigh up to see the Mrs. Wino's place, to see the uh, witches, uh, these mm -hmm. beautiful witches. And he wrote, the, this was wrote in the Somerset paper. And I'll never forget why, of course, uh, we always got the paper. And I had buddies, it was in the 1960s, I had buddies that came home and, uh, this is about the time, the week that, uh, that Henry Baker Rally came down with Nell Brock to see the Headless Horseman, or to see these witches, mm -hmm. these beautiful witches. And uh, anyways, my buddies, we came up, and Nell Brock was a friend of my grandmother. She lived the big house going across the bridge in her sign of there. It was the big house on the other side on the right. And... Uh, she used to, uh, actually, she used to have a, my grandmother was a good friend of hers, and she had a picture of a lady that if you looked at that picture long enough, her eyes opened. I mean, and it did. I'd look at it and stare at it, and her eyes seemed to open. But Nell Brock was a local legend. She used to come to the school and talk to her students about local history. Uh -huh. And she knew everything about this area. And she was quite a character, but she brought us up with Henry Baker Rally, uh, and uh, I will never forget. She t there was a road uh, back to where Mrs. Wino, I guess, lived, because it was an old road. I had a '49 Shiv, and she said, "This is a road. You have to go back here. You have to go back here." It was a '49 Shiv, and I took my '49 Shiv back that road, and back that road. It took out my exhaust system, my my tailpipe and my my uh, muffler, and she—I'll never forget her laughing. 
That's, those are, that's the witches. That's the witches. <laughs> she was convinced that that was the witches that did that to us. She was something, but uh, she lived down across, across the bridge, the big house on the right. It's a real big house. I forget even what it was called at one time. Well, you remember where well, Nell, or she lived down there? Yep. You remember Nell Brock? I, I know. I've heard. I know the name and stuff, but I, you know, I just can't remember about it. I'll it's tell you what. Too far back now. Well, when I bring buddies home like that, okay, she always put their name in the paper. She did a local column. And they, they ate that up, you know. Yeah. They'd see their name in the paper a week or so later. But I had brought others there, and, and she'd always put their names in the yeah. paper. Yeah. And, Did but, she have anything to do with that gladiola farm? No, I don't think so. No. Well, it was, was right there. She could have. Yeah. It was right there. Yeah. Yeah. Was it in yeah. your sign up? Yeah. My, my family did that. They had a huge field of gladiolas there, yeah. and yeah. they also did another one up on the mountain. Uh, I don't know where that area was up by uh, Cheryl's family, but everywhere you could look, it looked like you were in Holland. Yeah. And yeah. I can remember when I was a kid, they were all se sucker segregated by their colors, and it was it was like looking at a rainbow on the ground. It was beautiful. It was. But there was one in your sign, and the same fam, the same part of the family did that field in behind. There was a little store there, and you went in the back. And that entire field, and that was all my family. My sister worked there. Oh, I in that little that. store? She was going through school. She worked in the Gladiolia farm. Oh, really? <laughs> I remember going there with my mom because my grandma lived across the river. I was telling them mm -hmm. in that big yellow house. Mm -hmm. And that was yep. my great-grandmother. And we'd walk up there. There was a little swimming hole. So we kind of hung around yep. that area all the time. But those flowers, those gladiolias were gorgeous. Was that, like, where was that in relation to here, this gladiola farm? Over in, um, in your Sina. Okay. Over in your oh, Sina. Far from right. Georgia. Well, does, does right any... That road you were talking about, mm -hmm. my uncle used to go up there, that road with these trucks. It's terrible, wasn't it? Yes. Terrible <laughs> road. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. <laughs> you'd think you'd be rolling over the hill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, we had a lot of fun with that, the old uh, covered bridge, Aaron. It sounds like you did. Of we, course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. What he I said. did a lot of fishing underneath that bridge, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. I did a lot of fishing underneath that bridge. Yeah. Is there any, before we unveil the marker, is, is there anyone else who... I'll tell you a story. That's not a white horse. We have a farm right down here. And... And, and do you mind introducing yourself? Oh, and Gloria Johnson. I was a harness. I was going to say, Gloria. And, uh, and I was in the front of the yard mowing the grass one day. Scared to death. Here comes this horse just trotting up the road with a saddle on. Nobody on it. It wasn't running. Just a saddle on. And I kept looking for somebody to come. Maybe somebody was throwing off the horse, but he was just trotting along. And I, I was there for about two hours, and not a person came by and looked for a horse or anything. And it was kind of, kind of more I thought about it while I was mowing, the little eerier I felt. <laughs> it would be eerie, I think. Yeah. Describe where you live down there. That house, I still think that it should be a bed and breakfast. <laughs> it almost was. Yeah. But it sort of fell through. It's a, uh, yeah. it's a it would have been a it mansion. Was, it was built yeah. in 1822. <laughs> That, that house was built, 1822. Is that the, on the way to into Confluence along the right-hand side? No, it's on this road. It's, oh, it's on this road? Right okay. at the end of this the road. The last okay. house on this road before you get go on to 281. Okay. It's on the left. Okay. There's a barn and a big stone house. Oh, okay. My husband and I saw that. Gorgeous. There's yeah. so many beautiful yeah. homes up here. Yeah. It that, would take you a fortune that, to that, redo some that's of them. That's our property. Yeah, yeah. that's you, gorgeous. You you know, one thing, one thing, one thing I, one thing I remember is with my great grandmother that lived in your Sina, her family were really foragers. They would go out into the woods and and pick like all kinds of like mints, mints and different things that were medicinal things. My grandmother would make poultresses. So if you had a cold or whatever. I remember wearing a god awful mustard plaster around my neck all the time. She'd rub <laughs> stuff on you, you'd stink, you know. But it it worked. It broke up congestion and adding your chest and 
and I was wondering if uh, Prissy was involved in foraging because you know that's kind of like a little bit on the witchcraft kind of thing if people see you right. coming up with medicinal and people actually get better I you know. also wear mustard plaster, I think, all winter. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, my mom would get porousy all the time. My yeah. great-grandma did mustard, all kinds of things. She'd be cooking something on the stove that really smelt bad, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah. she was back at it. But she was a, um, a um, what was she? She delivered babies at home. Midwife. Midwife, midwife. midwife. that's midwife. the word. It was gone yeah. from my brain. She was a midwife. She yeah. delivered a lot of kids here. Um, delivered, actually, my sister and my other sisters. Okay. I was, Dr. Price delivered me. But... I think the poultricing and the foraging is part of that kind of the lore towards witchcraft. Right, right. Yeah. Things that can't quite be explained. Yeah, yeah. because medis uh, medicine wasn't really a, a real proven art back then. You, you got like maybe you got penicillin when you were sick, but right. you know that was the only thing they had to go on, like Indian ways and different things like that that they learned from their families. Okay. You know. Well. Before we unveil the marker, and I'm going to ask Jody and Terry to do that since they so kindly installed it for us, I am going to read just this one little paragraph from the Rockwood book, one of their volumes of Down the Road from Our Past. Um, and this is um, from an article by Paul E. Trimpey, Hexabarger or Witch's Hill. The story has it, the name was originated by Prissy and Sammy Rugg. Sammy was Prissy's husband. Two people who lived there in the old days. It seems that when Prissy married Sammy, her father gave her a beautiful white horse. Mm -hmm. After that, Prissy would go off anytime she felt like it. She would supposedly hex people when she went on these rides. When the inhabitants of the area would see her coming, or her horse, they would scurry off in fear. Mm -hmm. So, we'll never really know the true story of Prissy. I think most stories get passed along at some point in the beginning, there's some piece of truth to them, but we all heard how your stories about the Headless Horseman grew. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Hopefully Prissy would may maybe be a little flattered that we're we're dedicating this marker today um, here in Hexie. And again, thank you all for coming. We're going to have um, Jody and Terry unveil the marker. And then afterwards, we do have a few treats since it's almost Halloween. Um, there are a few little, there's water here in the um, cooler that Linda brought. Thank you, Linda. And some treats and a few in those little brown bags from the library, there's just some nice information on our library. So, you know, I guess they know that this was a big town at one time. Yeah. 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 All right, Terry and Jody, go ahead. <laughs> So that's our marker, and hopefully it stays stays nice over time for us. There was a, at one point, I think it was maybe Prissy's Thank you. granddaughter, and she married quick. Okay. And my grandma saw it. Nope, did it? So, are you a person who can hear too? Are you a person who can hear too? Yeah. I'm talking through the quick, and I found all of them about that. Story. When I got my book signed the first time, all right, thank you everyone for coming.